Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour or so you will find anywhere online today. Appreciate you taking some time to join us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. As always, our goal for the next 30 minutes is to educate and to inspire. Coming up on the show today, a couple of guys who are trying to make the world a better and a healthier place. They're fighting for the rights of animals, the LGBTQ community, and they also happen to be blogging about some delicious plant-based food. The Vegan Bows, Michael and Ethan are here. Gentlemen, good to see you. And we're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag. So get your questions ready, you nutrition nuts. Dr. Jazz, Dr. Jasmine Sardana will be here to answer your question. Dr. Jazz, looking forward to catching up with you. So just go ahead and drop your question right in the comment section. Now, we will be getting to as many as we possibly can by the end of the show. But first, before we go any further, let's get you caught up with what's going on in the world. Here are health headlines for Thursday, June 25th, 2020. If there was any doubt that the country was in the midst of a resurgence of coronavirus, it has now been put to bed. A record 38,000 new cases were reported Wednesday, more than any day during the height of the pandemic in April. Health officials say hotspots are popping up across much of the South and West, including the nation's three most populous states, California, Texas, and Florida, each tallying their own single day records as hospitals and intensive care units are swelling near capacity. One Houston-based doctor telling the Associated Press, People got complacent, and it's coming back to bite us. To date, there have been more than 2.3 million infections and 122,000 deaths linked to the coronavirus in the U.S. In brighter news, the pandemic does appear to be causing millions to examine their diets and explore getting healthier. The latest sign? Canada's vegan brand, The Very Good Butchers, saw shares of its parent company jump 800% following last week's initial public offering. This, as shares of Beyond Meat have nearly tripled since the beginning of the pandemic. And finally, what were you doing when you were 12? In the UK, Omari McQueen is busy becoming a leader in the plant-based community, already a pint-sized CEO of his own company, Dipalicious Dips. I love that name. Omari is now preparing to release his first cookbook, Best Bites, set for release next January, featuring 30 of his favorite recipes. Seriously, 12 years old. Omari, my friend, you are my hero. Keep it up, man. You are doing amazing work. We should try to get him on the show pretty soon. All right, let's move on. As a reminder, we're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag in just a little bit. So get your questions in now for Dr. Jazz. She's standing by to drop some serious nutrition knowledge. Post them up and we will be opening that mailbag in just a skosh. But my first guests are using their platform and their voices for liberty and justice for all, and they're doing it one meal at a time. They're fighting for the rights of animals and those in the LGBTQ community. And indeed, they are trying to change the world with one recipe at a time. Please welcome Ethan and Michael, known better as the Vegan Mo's. Gentlemen, how are we doing? Good, good, thank you. Thanks for having us. It's so great to have you here. And I know that you all are based in New York City. And so what has this whole COVID experience been like? I understand one of you was actually diagnosed with COVID. We were actually both, we both, did have we both had COVID uh, pretty early on. Uh, um, I'm actually sitting here in my office right now and uh, we, we take the pretty busy L train to and from Brooklyn into the city every day. And that's probably how we got it, although it could have been any number of my patients because community spread was pretty big at the beginning of the pandemic here. And uh, we got it in the third, fourth week of, yeah. of March. Michael, you had a- I had a really mild case, mild thankfully, case. just a bit of a scratchy throat, uh, occasional red eyes, lost taste for a day maybe, yeah. and that was it. You were- I was, I was, wall I was walloped. Um, I, had, I also had an upper respiratory infection like a regular winter cold, like maybe uh, a month before, and it had a lingering cough, so that probably made me a little bit more susceptible to the upper respiratory infection part. Thankfully, not in the hospital or anything like that, no intubation, anything like that, just really walloped us. And uh, yeah, your vegan diet will not protect you against a viral infection, despite, despite what people are putting out there. Um, we, are still more, we are still very susceptible to viral infections, and um, thankfully, uh, we fought it off well. And 
uh, now we're just in the business of trying to get back to business. It certainly doesn't offer immunity, but it would help, I guess, reduce your risk of having the comorbidities that are associated with COVID. And I know being a doctor, you have to look at that and say, wow, you know, my diet, if it was any different, the things could have been so much worse. Absolutely. A hundred percent. You know, a lot of the issues that I had before I adopted a plant-based diet were, were, I was overweight, probably medically defined as obese at the time. Uh, definitely was borderline high blood pressure, actually was contemplating going on uh, um, a pressure medication. I was on a statin for a number of years because of high cholesterol. Uh, so if I had stayed on that trajectory 11 years ago and not made the shift to a plant-based vegan diet, there's absolutely every reason I think I might have had a worse outcome. All right, now, hold on. You look like a young man, and you just said that you were put on statins, what, 11 years ago? So you were very was, young at that age. I was actually, I was put on statins. I went vegan almost 11 years ago, but uh, I was put on statins when I was 32. And uh, I have familial hypercholesterolemia, runs in my dad's side of the family, most men on that side of the family, with the exception of my dad and his brother now um, are gone early 60s uh, from usually a massive heart attack or some other cardiovascular issues. So um, this was something that was a real wake up call for me when I was following that same trajectory uh, in my 30s. And that's what sort of got me realizing, hey, I need to lose weight and I need to get myself fit. Um, a surgical residency is really bad for your health. And uh, I, I decided to take matters into my own hands and educate myself in the ways that I wasn't educated in my professional training on, on diet and and the truth about diet. Wow. Uh, geez, Louise. So when, when that conversation occurred uh, with the doctor, I mean, was you say that that was a wake-up call. Did you change overnight? Because I'm, I'm asking because I remember when I was still significantly overweight, morbidly obese in high school and being put on medication to treat high blood pressure, it took me another decade or so before I was ready to make the change. Was this like an overnight switch for you to really start cleaning things up? There kind of was. Um, I, I, I'd known I needed to do it. Um, at the time, we were taking care of our dog, who was um, very sick. He was at end stage uh, malignant melanoma. It was spreading through his body. And um, we were trying anything we could. Michael had reached out to a naturopath in Florida who was like, you need to get him grass-fed beef. And I was like, what, what's grass-fed beef? beef? You mean grass-fed cows? Like, what is this? So I went for the first time into a Whole Foods, bought this magic meat. I thought that was going to save our dog from melanoma. Um, and then on the way home, I stopped off at Five Guys and picked up a double bacon cheeseburger and, and a bag of fries. And a bag of fries, <laughs> as I often did at that time, and bit into it, and something happened. And I don't know what it was, um, but I started to feel really nauseated. And whether it was something... On a, on a larger level or whether it was something uh, within the actual meat itself, uh, it just got me to wrap it up and throw it out. And I went back into the kitchen and I said to Michael, I'm, I'm gonna become a vegetarian. This is it, I'm done. And uh, I did it while on Weight, Watch Weight Watchers with um, a bunch of friends who were doing a Weight Watchers challenge. So I had a support team, but I was doing it um, with <laughs> basically uh, being both a man and not postpartum like a lot of my friends were at the time and also uh, being vegetarian. And I, I lost an unbelievable amount of weight in a very short period of time. Michael, let me let me pivot to you because I remember the day that I, I told my wife I was going vegan and she looked at me like I had two heads and two was like, you're already the healthiest eater I know. Why do you want to do this? And blah, 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 blah. What was your reaction when he comes to you and he's like, hey, I'm going vegetarian. I was convinced, okay, great, this is just a phase because when we had first started dating, Ethan had actually told me that back many years before he had been vegetarian and right around when we started dating, he was even still sort of vegetarian and then started eating meat again, which is probably my fault. <laughs> so I really thought, oh, this is just gonna be a little phase thing, a couple of days, maybe a week or two, and then things will progress back to normal. Uh, surprisingly, they didn't. They kept going, as it were. And the interesting thing was, I was working out of the house at, at the time, so I was doing the bulk of our cooking, so I started to learn how to take the recipes that we would always be eating and say, how can I make this so it's something Ethan's still going to eat and be something I want to eat, and vice versa. 
And it became just a really fun challenge for me learning how to adapt recipes so they'd be vegan friendly. And, and that's that's the genesis for Vegan Mo's and the blog and all of that, it sounds. That is basically how it all started. The blog's so, about two years after that, because I was, the idea of being vegetarian, let alone vegan, was not even something I was entertaining at the time. That was not going to happen. But Ethan went vegan several months later. And again, I thought it was going to be a phase, but it wasn't. And I just kept going with what I was doing and listening to things that Ethan was saying. But the more he would try to convince me to go vegan, the more I would dig my heels in and say, you're not going to tell me what to do. <laughs> pushing someone to do something <laughs> when you when you push someone they don't quite come in the direction that you want they go the direction so you're I, right. when i stopped being evangelical in my first year of being vegan and when i realized that you know the only person who changed anything in this relationship was me and if he's willing to accept me for the change then i need to accept that he's exactly who he ever said he was um and when i made my peace with that and i stopped pushing he literally had the space to look at it and to walk into it of his own accord. And interesting, interestingly, I saw in my memories on social media the other day, had a post saying, oh, it's, I forgot to do my meatless Monday yesterday, so I'm doing a Tofu Tuesday today instead. And that's literally how it started for me. I started with meatless Mondays for several weeks, then Tofu Tuesdays and then Westerable Wednesdays, and I kept going until I hit a full week and Ethan didn't know I was doing anything beyond the Mondays no clue. until I told him it's like oh by the way I'm vegan now so <laughs> it took me longer and a much slower process but even though I knew I was doing the right thing it was not as easy for me just to flip the switch and do it how did your body respond as you were making that gradual change did you start to feel better a little bit day by day um, I think because it was such a gradual change I really didn't notice any changes going on, whereas I think for people who switch overnight, they're going to notice a much more dramatic shift. It's almost like when you live with someone and you don't notice them gaining weight or losing weight or changing over the years because you're both changing and you see each other all the time, that every time you see a change, it just becomes part of who that person is and you don't notice it. Whereas if I haven't seen you in two years, I'm going to notice everything that's different about you from how you looked the last time I saw you. All right, let's uh, change gears here a little bit. This is uh, Pride Month, and yeah. I will say that we are living in a time when inequalities are coming to light for so many different uh, things out there. And for a lot of people, they're just seeing this light being shown on these inequalities for the first time. And they're realizing that there's actually a lot of overlap there. And I know with you in particular, you all are both very much involved in animal advocacy and LGBTQ uh, efforts as well. So is there a connection between the two? Is there overlap? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Huge. I think, I think that whether you're talking about animal rights and animal liberation, whether you're talking about Black Lives Matter, whether you're talking about uh, LGBT rights, whatever group of individuals um, that are marginalized and minoritized within our culture, within the dominant culture, what you're really talking about is where someone has uh, 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 someone or a group of individuals who are part of the dominant culture have decided we are the norm and you are the other. And it's the moment when you otherize an individual or group of individuals that you have now somehow dehumanized them or made them less than in their human status or in their non-human status. And so it is that otherizing that I think that all of these, these, these issues and these movements uh, have in common. They are, are different struggles within the common fight for collective liberation. And so when we think about um, Black Lives Matter, um, I, as a white cisgendered um, gay man who also was raised Jewish and has that kind of otherized identity, um, I can relate to it on some level, but on a fundamental level, I don't understand it. And I can't possibly understand it, but I can be an ally. Just like as somebody who has been the victim of discrimination for being a gay man and being part of the LGBT community and being out about that, 
I can appreciate what it's like to be otherized or not seen for who you are. And so I think that very much informed my empathy for non-human animals and recognizing that, you know, if I did anything to one of my dogs that is routine, standard practice in the animal agriculture industry towards a chicken or a pig or a cow or a goat or any other farmed animal, uh, you know, that, that's legal to do to a farmed animal. It's not legal to do to a dog or, or, a, or a cat. And that's not okay because they share the same common important values of their sentient. They can feel pain, they can feel joy, and they, um, they should not be harmed in that way. You use the word normal in there. And there's a great quote from the old television show House that said, normal is overrated. And I think that if people would just kind of keep that in mind, the world would absolutely be a more open and accepting place. Um, Michael, would you would you agree with that? I mean, normal can be just so daggone boring. Yeah, um, I always like saying, who wants to be normal? <laughs> uh, because I mean, yeah, normal is kind of boring, and just because something is seen as being normal doesn't mean that it's right. Doesn't mean that it's natural. Doesn't mean that it's the way it should be. I like to think of it as as people approach middle age, such as us, which I don't like admitting, but we are. You know, things like you. Know, Getting off the couch isn't quite as easy as it used to be. Or like that growth that is involuntary when you get out of a chair or getting out of bed. Is that, is that normal? Well, that's becoming our normal, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good or bad thing. It just, it's what it is. <laughs> A couple more uh, questions here as uh, as we take this home. First of all, neither one of you look like you're, you're middle age. I mean, it's just impossible. Uh, the fact that, I mean, you both are in your 40s is just, might consider my mind blown. Um, but I, let, let's have some fun here. I, I cannot let you guys go from this show today without asking about your relationship with Alan Cumming, who wrote the Ford to your cookbook. And my producer, Donna Steele, is a huge Alan Cumming fan. How did oh, you all link up? This is actually, it's one of those, the stars just sort of all lined up yeah. at the exact moment. We were brainstorming with some friends about who should write the foreword to our book, NYC Vegan, Iconic Recipes for a Taste of the Big Apple. And we wanted a well-known person who was ideally someone in the LGBTQ community and also who was vegan. So we were choosing for a very narrow, narrow pool. And one of our really good friends, Liz, just immediately said, oh, what about Alan Cumming? So we looked at each other and were like, well, that's brilliant. How do we reach him? I have a friend from high school who is now an agent in Hollywood. So I reached out to her saying, hey, I hate to be one of those people. I don't want you doing me a favor. But if you are able to tell me who I might be able to contact to get in touch with Alan, here's what we're looking for. She's vegetarian, so she was totally cool with it. Said, great, send me what you want to send. I'll get it to his people. At the same time, we had just posted a picture of a new vegan burger that had come out on Instagram. And somebody actually tagged Alan Cumming in their comments saying, hey, uh, Alan Cumming snaps, have you seen this? And then we get a notification, Alan Cumming is following you. Our jaws dropped because he was only following about 190 people at the time. We were 190 that he was following. And so we said, okay, what do we do? So we just shot him a message on Instagram and said, hey, would you be following us? us? <laughs> We're, We're doing this book. Would you be interested in writing the forward? Said, sure, here's my email address. Tell me what you need. And it was really sweet. He was a great guy. That is how it happened. Wow, what a story. What a story, man. That is fantastic. All right, final question is this. So rarely do we get couples on the show, but it is absolutely positively mandatory that when we do, I think back to my old days getting my start in radio as a producer for a love song show. So with that said, I need to know how you guys met, how you guys linked up, how did you find each other? Tell me the grand love story, please. Um, well, uh, it was, uh, 16 years ago last weekend, um, we were, I had just uh, finished my residency the year prior. Um, I took a job in Philly, took a job upstate, um, didn't like the fit of either of those practices. 
practices, came back to New York and decided that um, I needed to uh, just sort of start over, connected with a friend of mine who I had dated years earlier and said, hey, I need a new experience of living in New York. I didn't really want to come back. And he's like, meet new friends, make my, meet my friends. And um, this was pre-Facebook time, but Friendster. there was something called Friendster, which was a <laughs> social network. If and so MySpace. I started picking off his friends and saying, hey, you're friends with Tom, I'm friends with Tom, let's go out. And I, I met a couple of friends, it was really nice. And then I shot him a message and said, hey, you seem like a nice guy. Let's go out for like a drink or something. And he's like, sure, let's do it. He's like, I'm going out for a movie tomorrow. Do you want to come? And so I was like, sure. And I'm thinking like, yeah, he's really attractive. But like, I'm not dating. I just got out of a relationship. To date. We were not looking to date. And as soon as we met each other, we were like, uh-oh. Uh-huh. And then we went and sat down in the dark for two hours and watched days. Um, and then afterwards, he's like, you want to go to dinner? I'm like, sure, let's go eat. So we go to eat, and halfway through the dinner, I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to be great. Yeah, that was it. Fantastic. Fantastic. I love that. Friendster, by the way. Oh, my gosh, man. You you just, like, brought me all the way back. Yeah, Holy cow. We're 49. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that's so great. Vegan Moe's, you guys are just the best delights. Ethan and Michael, check them out, veganmoe's.com on Instagram, also at Vegan Moe's. Uh, you guys keep up the fantastic work. It has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. Likewise. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. All right. Time now to open up the doctor's mailbag. So go ahead and post your nutrition and health-related questions in the comments section right now as we welcome Dr. Jazz, Jasmal Sardana from the Barnard Medical Center back to the exam room live. How you doing today, Dr. Jazz? Doing great, Chuck. How are you? Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for making your grand return. A lot of people are chatting us up, so let's get right into it. Ronald on Facebook wants to know, is there any proof that a, quote, healthy lifestyle, which is whole food, plant-based, no oil, plenty of exercise, plenty of sleep, has a benefit to improving the immune system, especially for the elderly. He says he's 83. Oh, yes, great. Um, Number one, yes. So our immune system um, can potentially get less and less effective with age. So with him being in his 80s, I think it's an absolutely relevant question. Certainly with age comes um, more risk as our immune system, you know, gradually declines. Now, the question about how important and how effective and what role does lifestyle play in building that immunity? Um, there's a large role that nutrition, physical activity, sleep, um, stress reduction, and mindfulness have, and also having relationships with people have on your immune system. And um, it's not so much boosting your immune immune system per se, it's really building a strong foundation for a strong immune system. So eating a whole food plant-based diet where your diet is majority filled with amazing magical things like fiber, Um, When you have phytochemicals in those plants and certainly making sure that you're getting a variety of plants throughout the week, multiple colors. Um, And as you know, with each different color comes different uh, phytonutrients with plant. So getting that variety, eating the rainbow absolutely affects your immune system because those phytonutrients act as antioxidants. They help to reduce the um, daily assault of free radicals that we consume that we're exposed to. So absolutely whole food plant-based diet is helpful for your immune in building and supporting your immune system. Physical activity, activity similarly, um, you know, just with conditioning of your heart, with your muscles, just being in a physically fit state um, with improved circulation and with your lungs functioning and oxygenation, that translates to just being that much more resilient should anything happen to you physically. Um, sleep is another big thing, getting restorative sleep, because during the time that you're sleeping, what your body's truly doing is healing and repairing from the damage of the day. Um, and being able to get that restorative amount of sleep helps with that repair and helps you face another day, helps your immune system face another day that much more resilient. So all of those things, and I love Chuck, the question, because it doesn't just, um, ask about a specific, 
vitamin. It's not asking about a specific ingre- um, supplement. It's actually asking about lifestyle and all these different factors. And I think that's the big takeaway that I'd love for everyone to take home is that you're the strength of your immune system is not found within a bottle. It's going to be found within the things that you're doing every single day, how you're eating, how you're moving, how much sleep you're getting, how much stress you're allowing and how you're managing that. Ooh, that is a quote of all quotes there. Okay. Dr. Jazz bringing the heat. Uh, <laughs> Bao, by the way, says that you rock. So uh, I, oh, I, wow. Bao, I agree. Uh, here's a great question from Edith at 1225. She wants to know what is pre-diabetes and how is it diagnosed? Great. So pre-diabetes. Okay. So diabetes is um, a condition in which your body is no longer to you or has a decreased ability to utilize the amount of sugar that your, your body's breaking down from the foods that you're eating. So say you're taking a bite of an apple or, or your meal, your lunch for the day, your body breaks that down, the carbohydrates, proteins, et cetera, breaks that down and allows it to be utilized as energy in the form of something called glucose. There's a gland in our body, really important gland called pancreas that releases a, a hormone called insulin. And insulin acts as a signal to help soak up and absorb all the sugar, allows you allowing, for example, our muscles to soak up all of the blood sugar to use it as um, fuel. What happens when someone develops prediabetes is something called insulin resistance. Um, or there, there's two, two things that can happen with the development of diabetes. There's a reduction in your pancreas functioning well, or something called beta cell dysfunction. Beta cells are the actual specific cells within the pancreas that release the hormone. And, and for whatever reason, they may not work well. In addition, you develop something called insulin resistance, where, you know, the signal that this hormone sending out after some time just isn't working any longer. Your muscle cells just aren't listening to them. And what we found from research, first of all, this is a very complex issue. I, I, you know, I don't mean to, you know, make it too simple. It's very complex. But what we do understand from insulin resistance, one of the, th- a huge factor in it, is the amount of saturated fat that's in our in our uh, meats. Uh, I'm sorry, in our meals, for example, from meats. And so when there's a lot of saturated fat that our muscle cells hold on to, it essentially interrupts the signaling that insulin sending out. So insulin resistance increases. And, and so your body, your pancreas is pounding and churning out this insulin. And as you can imagine, at the end of, you know, several years of doing this, your pancreas is going to feel like, man, I'm beat up. So pre-diabetes is when your hemoglobin A1C, which is a lab value that helps us measure how well your blood sugar has been controlled over the course of three months, starts to creep up. It's not quite yet at 6.5, which is the threshold to diagnose diabetes. It's somewhere between 5.7 and 6.4. And what that tells us is that this insulin resistance, beta cell dysfunction is starting to become a problem. And it's it's the, it's the time that happened, or I'm sorry, it's the um, disease process that occurs right before full-blown diabetes. But with the great an important thing to know about that is that you just because you get pre-diabetes, that doesn't mean that you're automatically going to get diabetes. In fact, finding the reason why we diagnose pre-diabetes and screen for these things is because we want to capture our patients before they develop full-blown diabetes. Because during this stage, and even in some early stages of diabetes and even further, with a whole food plant-based diet, with good lifestyle choices, such as regular physical activity, guess what? Those numbers don't have to stay in that range. They can actually, you can knock them right back down to normal. They don't ever have to progress into diabetes. So again, another important piece for um, plug for for lifestyle changes. So pre-diabetes is that stage right before diabetes and it's diagnosed with hemoglobin A1C. The numbers, uh, important numbers to know are 5.7 to 6.4. But um, another good takeaway is that your lifestyle can uh, make make a huge difference. Kind of along the same lines, Kathy Hines at 1225 says, I'm starting the 21 day kickstart program on Saturday. Kathy, good luck. I think you're going to do great. But she says, my diabetes is out of control. Is there a list of foods you should not eat such as coconut oil or coconut milk? Um, Yeah. So specifically, since you said specifically about coconut milk and coconut oils, I will say that they are saturated fats. And those are the specific types of fats that we want to stay away from. 
Um, those who eat plant-based essentially don't really get a ton of saturated fat in their diet because the majority of the saturated fat that we eat come from meat and meat products, such as dairy and cheese. Um, however, there are some plant sources like, as you mentioned, coconut oils um, and that are that's also found in coconut milk. And saturated fat um, is absolutely something that you want to get rid of because, as I mentioned earlier, it can interfere with, it can contribute to insulin resistance. So fat is a good, um, saturated fat, coconut oil, coconut milk are good things to avoid. If you're going to use them, use them very sparingly, um, but something that you should probably limit uh, considerably in your diet and completely avoid if you can. Uh, Kathy coming up with this question at 1226. I sympathize with you so much. She says, I love nuts and seeds, but can't control how much I eat. I need to keep them out of my mouth. Do I need to keep them out of the house? And will I miss out on anything by avoiding them? Great question. Nuts and seeds are wonderful. And you know, with all of us, to some degree, we think a little bit is good, and a lot of it must be really, really good. But unfortunately, you know, nuts and let me tell you, nuts and seeds are, are essential. They are healthy. They are good foods. Because of the fat content of them, however, um, it can sometimes undo all of the good work that you might be hoping to gain from adopting a whole food plant-based diet, such as losing weight. And losing weight is really important for lots of other things like decreasing insulin resistance, improving blood pressure, uh, et cetera. So finding a way for you to, if so this is going to be a really personal um kind of decision and choice and and something I work with my patients, we actually have very similar conversations with my patients at Barnard Medical Center about how, what foods, some patients just can't have certain foods in their house. And if that, if nuts are that for you, keep them out of the house, maybe use them or choose them if you're eating out or um, if you're having, if there's a special occasion for them, if that's something that you really feel like, you know what, I really can't face nuts constantly and be tempted by them without overindulging, get them out of the house. But if you're at a place where you feel like, okay, I just need to portion control, limit the amount of um, nuts that are in your home. For example, don't go to Costco and get the big box because you want to save uh, money on it uh, because you might inadvertently end up eating a lot of it. So limit the amount that you're bringing in would be the other uh, question. And I, you know, you don't have to completely cut them out because I think they are health foods. You just have to find a healthy way to eat them in the right portions. Question from Anita at 1229. My A1C used to be 5.7, but I've gone plant-based and now it's showing as low at 4.7. Should I be concerned that that is too low? No, you know, I've actually seen patients in my clinic who've had very low hemoglobin A1C numbers. And, and and to backtrack just a teeny bit, hemoglobin A1Cs aren't a 100% perfect marker for every single person. We know from research that, you know, those numbers can vary depending on who you are uh, potentially. So I wouldn't take too much stock in a one number at one point. Um, one, I want to say congratulations for bringing that number down. That's hard work. I commend you for that keep doing what you're doing. Don't be discouraged by your hemoglobin A1C going down that low. Um, it's better to go that way versus it being higher. So no, I wouldn't worry about it. I would check in with your doctor, however, and just kind of make sure that your blood sugar levels are okay. Uh, they're staying consistent, but check in with your doctor um, for um, you know specific medical advice regarding that. Ian says that his A1C is at 4.3. Baby, congratulations, Ian. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, I know, right? Uh, we have time for just a couple of more. Uh, here's one from Carol, 1229. I've been whole food plant-based for several years and have osteoporosis. Can that be treated with a whole food plant-based diet and exercise or is medication required? Yeah. So again, another pretty specific question. Um, you'd have to discuss your full health, you know, um, health history with your physician. However, a whole food plant-based diet is absolutely wonderful for osteoporosis. You know, we've been kind of taught that we need salmon and not necessarily just the omega-3s. We've been told that we need milk or dairy and not calcium. So pulling apart some of that is really key and important because in our mindset, I think dairy and bone health have been linked and intertwined just because of how we live and all the messaging and, and uh, the very focused messaging that we get. A whole food plant-based diet has calcium, 
uh, rich foods um, in plants, in vegetables, in, in fruits that you're eating. And if you're getting, again, a, ver a variety of those plants, you're going to be set up for really good bone health. And you brought, up, you brought up another great point, which is physical activity. We know, again, that research tells us that weight-bearing exercises, regular physical activity, and it doesn't have to be overboard, right? You can walk, you can get out there. Um, as long as you're moving and doing things that are helpful for your uh, physical health, that's going to translate into bone health. So the combination of a whole food plant-based diet along with regular physical activity, I think you're going to be set. You're going to do really well. Last question comes to us from Anu. She wants to know, what are the veggies that we can put in a smoothie and not lose any of their fiber? Oh, great. Yes. Um, so a lot of vegetables potential, you're, you're still going to get the fiber um, if you're putting them in a smoothie. When you lose the time when you lose fiber in vegetables is, is mostly when you juice it, right? So if you're putting fruits and you're putting vegetables through a juicer, and all of the pulp that's kind of left over, um, which can be used for lots of wonderful things. I, I learned recently that you can make uh, carrot pulp after you juice carrots at that pulp left over, you can turn that into sushi, which is really cool. Anyway, so the pulp that's left over after juicing, that's all the fiber. However, if you're making a smoothie and you're not juicing and all that fiber is still there, it's probably broken down into smaller bits and that's okay. So smoothies are fine, juicing you lose the fiber. So I would stick with smoothies and the vegetables that you can add are anything, anything that's appealing to you. I use a lot of kale, I use a lot of um, spinach and beets uh, in our uh, smoothies at home and it doesn't taste, it, you know, change the flavor one bit. In fact, it tastes even more delicious. Um, so it's, stick more with smoothies because um, you'll still get the fiber with smoothies. All right. Uh, Omar, Annie, I know that we didn't get to your questions today and everyone else, but I promise you we have them saved. We will try to get to them on an upcoming episode. So stay tuned for that. And also uh, I see Shane, I'm going to call you sugar Shane here, Shane, even though we're talking about A1C. He says, I lowered my A1C from 7.2 to 5.1 in three months doing a whole food plant-based diet. Yes. That's awesome. Amazing. I love hearing that. I love it. So many success stories in the comments today that I just, I love that so much. Uh, so the final, final question here really is one that we get so often, and that is where can I find a good plant-based doctor? Well, it just so happens Dr. Jazz isn't just on the show today. <laughs> He's available uh, via telemedicine, uh, and that is good for a lot of our doctors and dietitians at the Barnard Medical Center. I know that right now you are still keeping super busy, even though you're not seeing patients in the actual doctor's office. We're going to get back to our office soon. So, But in the meantime, we've been doing telehealth, and it's been such a convenient, wonderful way to stay connected to our patients. So please, yeah, I would love to see you. Absolutely. And you can make an appointment by visiting barnardmedical.org or by picking up the phone and calling 202-527-7500. Even if you don't live in the Washington, D.C. area, say you live in California or New York, Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, or Kentucky, any one of those states, you can make an appointment with one of our doctors and dietitians. Now just head over to, you see that right there on the screen, barnardmedical.org or call 202-527-7500. 500. Dr. Jazz, thank you so very much for your time today. We are super enlightened. Thank you so much, Chuck. All right. And also out today, my friends, is a brand new episode of the Exam Room podcast. And this, this one is an important one. It's called Eating as if the World Depended on It. Eating as if the World Depended on It. Because really, it does. The show today features an exclusive extended interview with Dr. David Katz about how our dietary choices are impacting the environment, animals, our health, so many things. And I also asked him about our current pandemic, and he gave me this quote I wanted to share with you. I thought that this was so powerful. He said, if the global appetite for meat went away, most, if not all, the pandemic plagues would also go away. Think about that for a second. If you want to check out the interview, it is 100% on point. You can head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify or Stitcher, really wherever the finest podcasts are available. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit that subscribe button. And please, if you would be so kind, also leave a five-star rating.
My thanks again to the Vegan Moes, Ethan and Michael, for joining us today and the crew that makes The Exam Room Live possible, our director, Emily Cologne, and producers, Donna Steele and Laura Anderson. For Dr. Jazz and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching. And until tomorrow, remember, take a stand, stay safe, and keep it plant-based.